Hey everyone, uh, thanks so much for joining me tonight um, on this Musical Monday, or as I maybe now will call it Monday Night Live, I don't know. Um, thanks everyone um, who's watching on Facebook Live and who's watching on Instagram Live. It's really great to be with you and share with you today. Um, if you don't know me, uh, that's odd because somehow you're watching this, but if you don't know who I am, my name's David Rao, and I'm the music teacher who blogs at makemomentsmatter.org. You can also find my ideas, obviously, here on Facebook, um, on um, Instagram. I'm also on Pinterest and um, a variety of other platforms. You can find me when you search my name or Make Moments Matter Music Ed. Um, one place that you can also find me is on my podcast, which is Make Moments Matter, a music education podcast. It's available on Spotify, um, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere where you listen to your podcasts. Um, and if it's not there, let me know and I'll see if I can have it added to that space. Um, well, today I'm really excited because I um, get to share with you a little bit about my second grade lessons for the week. Normally on these, pod or on these videos, I share my K through five lessons for the whole week. Um, and then I do a deep dive on one grade. Well, as has happened before, um, I'm on a weird schedule. I see my students once um, every eight school days for 45 minutes. And so the lessons that I talked about last Monday Night Live, I am still talking about today because I'm still teaching those same lessons. So instead of rolling you all through those same lessons, um, I'm gonna do something a little bit different. And in the first half of the video, I'm gonna share a little bit how I, um, about how I organize centers. Um, because, you know, I think a lot of us have questions about centers or want to learn more because it's just sort of uh, the logistical stress is a little bit of a stress trying to get everything um, organized. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that organization, some of the behind the scenes things that I do to make my life um, a little bit easier when it comes to using centers and make centers easier to find and use. So that's what I'll talk about first. And then I'm gonna talk um, about my second grade lessons for the week um, and do a deep dive and show you all the resources um, and everything else that's involved in those second grade lessons. So that's my plan for today. Um, just a couple little housekeeping things. If you're watching the video and something sparks your interest mid-video or you have a question or you know, I talk about a link or a resource I use, um, I'm gonna try and put all of those links and things in one place. And if you go to my blog, which is makemomentsmatter.org and click on the videos tab, um, down at the bottom there should be a, a thing that says Make uh, Musical Mondays Recap. And that um, on, on there on today's week, week 10, um, you'll find all the links and resources that I've talked about all in just one place. So you can click through and find whatever it is that I might've mentioned. Um, one of the other things is that it is my 10th week doing this, which seems a little bit crazy. Um, but because I've been doing this for 10 weeks, um, I want to get your feedback. So um, in, in those links page, and um, later I'll put it in the comments for Facebook, um, if you would take just a few minutes, it takes about three or four minutes to leave a little bit of feedback about what you think is valuable in these videos, what you think I could do better. I really appreciate that. It is anonymous feedback. So if you're like, you're clogging up my Facebook feed, get out and <laughs> stop doing these videos. You can say that anonymously if you want. Um, but at the end, if you like have a question or something, you really want me to contact you and follow up, um, you can leave your name and just something that says, you know, please contact me in your name and email and I'll find you and I'll do that. But otherwise, I mean, if you want to throw rotten tomatoes at me, you can do that through the feedback. Um, and it is anonymous. And, and if you give me that feedback, there is a thank you gift at the end for completing that. So, um, if you uh, feel inclined after the video, please check that out and I'll put the link in the Facebook comments and also it's on that link page. If you're on Instagram and you're watching, um, my link in profile, the very top thing should say um, feedback form or, or whatever so that you can go there too. Um, if you have trouble accessing that, send me a PM later. Okay, um, thanks everyone for your comments already. The last thing I wanted to just say is that I always really value your comments and questions along the way because um, I know that I explain it in a way that I maybe think makes sense, but um, if you have questions or comments along the way, please leave those. It is really helpful for other teachers to see that other people are having their same questions. It's helpful for me so I know that I can try and address those questions if I have the answers. And it's really cool to see, you know, like someone on Facebook posts a question and someone else on Facebook gives their version of an answer or their idea or something that they think is working um, just so that, you know, we can have a conversation sort of as a music education community and not just I am sitting here talking about my lessons, but it gives us a chance to sort of uh, share together. So those comments and questions are really valuable. 
All right, well, let me get to um, the content for tonight. So like I said, I'm not gonna give you my K-5 recap. If you want that recap of all my lessons that I'm teaching in this cycle, you can go back to last week's video, um, which is week nine. Um, and in that video, the first half is just a K-5 recap where I share a little bit about all of my lessons. Um, because for those of you who watched last week, it'd be boring to watch that again. So I'm not gonna do that. Instead, I wanted to share a little bit about Center's organization. Um, I was very fortunate. Today was a, a professional development day in my uh, school district. And um, I was asked to talk just a little bit about Center's. And so I shared a little bit today with my colleagues and I figured I would share with all of you all as well. Um, one of the things that I think is maybe the most daunting about centers and learning centers in general is the logistics and we get caught up in the but what if this and what about this and how do I do this and how do I make this and so I want to share just a little bit today I've blogged before I have two or three blog posts about centers I've done live videos showing you how I sort of lead kids through some centers and so I thought today it'd be sort of cool to talk about how I organize sort of the behind the scenes of centers and how I set that up to sort of give you an idea of um, what that looks like for me um, so I would say the very first thing is that setting up for centers takes longer than you think. So don't say like, Ooh, I've got these cool centers. I'm going to do this on Monday. No, <laughs> give yourself more time to make quality centers that you know will last. Um, because if you're going to put the time into making them, make them so that they're really going to be there for as many years as you need them. Um, that's why I always print on cardstock. I print in color if I can, or I print on colored cardstock and then I laminate everything <laughs> because I want it to last because I know that centers are resources that are touched and moved around and played with and thrown around more than other resources in my classroom so I try and make them more durable. Um, that said I, I laminate them, I cut them out, I bag them up um, and I organize them so that it makes sense to me and so that if things accidentally get shifted around that I am able to unshift later. Um, a great example I do these rhythm sort activities and the way that they work is they're, they're different cards. There are about 30 different words with rhythms on there. Um, and uh, what I do is I have them a couple different formats. So if you've ever tried one of these, you know that already. But um, you can either print a full page with the rhythm and the word and the picture. You can print four to a page or you can print nine to a page. I usually do the print nine to a page. They turn out to be about this big. Um, this is my instruments rhythm sort. Um, and so I end up with nine to a page, nine images to a page. So I take those with my paper cutter and I cut them into nine separate images. So there'd be like nine castanets, there'd be nine harps, there'd be nine trumpets. In this set, it's all about instruments. Um, so then I make nine separate baggies of those words. So I have nine bags with 30 different words in them. Um, and what I do, because I know as much as I try, I know that sometimes kids will mix up the bags and I don't want someone to end up with like, you know, a bag full of nine cellos. Like that's not going to do them any good. I want them to have a variety of words. So what I do on the back is I write in, um, it's hard, sorry, it's hard to see that at Facebook. I write a little number on the back. Um, this is from bag eight. Guess what? On the bag, it says bag eight. Um, and I did those all in pink with a pink magic marker or a pink Sharpie, not a magic marker. So then if I pull the next bag, this one says seven, it's written in brown um, and it's easier for, for me to see. It's um, always written in the same place on the card. The bag has a brown seven. Um, the blues are ones. So if for some reason they got all mixed up, I can just say, hey, small group, can you make sure that all your cards have the same number on the back? It takes about a minute. And they do, and if they're like, oh no, there's a nine in here. Oh, okay, well, who has the nines? And then I can have the kids separate. That's one of the things I do. Um, and it, it just makes my life a lot easier doing different colors for the different numbers and also different numbers, different bags, that, that really helps. Um, one other thing I would say when you're making these, um, if you can, make an extra copy um, or, or put all the resources in a very safe place because it's the worst feeling if you have a center that you use so much that you love um, and after using it lovingly for several years some of the cards are bent or dirty or gross or whatever you know something happens things get lost if you can't find that digital resource to reprint in a couple years or if you can't find the same paper you used or whatever I know that really bothers some people um, and so if you already have it pre-done that's 
that's nice. So in my case, um, I usually do only eight centers, but it prints nine to a page. So that ninth bag, I won't use, I'll keep it out of rotation so that then if I have to replace it later on, I can. But it's nice to have that extra copy. If you're printing from a digital source, if you buy something from Teachers Pay Teachers, or you find it online or you make it yourself, put it in a safe place, back it up, put it on the cloud, whatever, so that you don't, um, you don't get stress later on if you lose those resources. Okay, so that's one thing I would say. Um, another thing I would say is when I am putting them away, um, I put them, all the resources, in big, clear plastic tubs. That's because the first year I did this, I put them in like the cheap, just opaque tubs that I would get on sale, and that was fine, but then if I wanted to pull something out sort of at the last minute or any time, it was just harder to find. So if you can put it in a clear container, that makes it a lot easier to find. Um, one of the other things is if you're putting it in bags like this, that's great. Um, what I learned is if you take um, a hole punch and you punch one corner, then when a kid inevitably does this, they zip it closed and go, it doesn't pop your bag because there's a spot for the air to escape. Actually, I felt it because there's a hole right here. So when I went like this, I felt whoosh of air coming out of the bag. I cannot tell you how often that has saved me from having to rebag or, or find a new bag because I've put the hole punch in there um, and that stops kids from destroying my bags. Um, that was something that like changed my life. So <laughs> I know it's so simple, but it made uh, bagging up things a lot easier. Um, so this is a bag full of bags. Um, this is what uh, set off the, se <laughs> the security the last time I went through the airport with these. Um, apparently they saw the bags and <laughs> flagged me. But anyway, um, so I have bags inside bags. So there's all my centers in just one bag, right? Um, that works great unless you have a full size, like eight and a half by 11 page that you have laminated and you wanna keep like for directions or if it's part of the center or whatever, those do not fit well in the gallon baggies. So what I found online, um, I found these sort of cool snap folders. I think they're called poly folders, I could be wrong, but they fit um, an eight and a half by 11 page, really easy, even laminated, even if you leave a little bit of space on the outside. So, and they snap close. Um, they come in a variety of colors, um, which is great because then my next suggestion is to color code if you can. Um, so I know when I pull things out that the red ones are all treble clef um, or treble clef matching or something to do with uh, the lines and spaces. And I can look in my box and say red, 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 and pull all those out if I'm doing um, centers that I want treble clef centers. Um, I know that the green ones um, are all, let's see, the green ones in this case are instruments of the orchestra, uh, the yellow are recorders. It just makes my life a lot easier. They were really not that expensive. I got like a set of 25, um, and I can put a link to that if, if y'all are interested in that. But that's great, especially for um, larger papers. So if you're not cutting up lots of bags and baggies, um, they do fit baggies, and I have several like this one, um, my Star Wars rhythms. I've got the baggies in here along with the game boards, um, you know, where it has like the Ewoks or, um, you know, Princess Leia out, out in space or the Millennium Falcon. It has all of that and I can put that in along with um, the baggies and it makes, makes it easier to find but also keeps it all together in one place. You can fit quite a lot in these. Um, I haven't used these snap folders for a long time so I can't talk about the durability but I, I'll also say I don't give these to kids. These are just for me. So I pull all the stuff out and put it in a bin that then the kids would take and use. So the kids are not handling these, which I think is going to extend the life. <laughs> um, so the Ziploc bags are great if you have lots of baggies. Color coding is great. I color code everything. So I color coded um, the little pockets these are in. Another great example, and I've shown these on a live video before, but my um, Fishing for a Melody, like the recorder centers, um, these are also color coded. If you see them on TPT or on my website or something, they come in, uh, like I, when I designed them, I had a colorful background, but I did not use them, use that when I printed them. I printed them in black and white on colored paper. And the reason is because station one is green and station two is blue. So I know if I wanna put in a baggie a station one and station two, I just pull those colors and I take out you know, the ketchup and mustard colors and I don't need to use those right away. It makes it really quick. 
Um, also, then with kids, if I have them sitting in a small group and I want, you know, I want them to only do one station at a time, but I want them to share a bag because I don't want to make as many of these. Um, I don't want to make a bag for each kid. That's a lot of paper. Um, I could say sit in groups of three or four and you're going to just share a bag. You're not going to work together. You're just going to share a bag. So then I could say someone takes the blue cards, someone takes the green cards, someone takes the yellow cards. And then I can see even from across the room, if you know, Johnny Tushu, whatever, is like using yellow and red. I'd be like, Johnny, you need the blues or whatever, or you just one color. And, and even in that situation, the color coding is worth it. But especially for these centers, the yellow and the red are more advanced. So I would probably pull out the green and blue and the first time I handed them out, I would just hand out green and blue. But in, that means I don't have to like go through and look for the little number that I put on there. I can just pull the color and it probably saves me about 20 minutes every time I'm trying to separate these out, every time I use these. So color code the, the material itself if you want. If there are different levels, you could put them on different colored paper um, or color code the bags, color code the number on the back. I'm, I'm a color coder, I like that. Um, and, and it saves me a lot of time. Um, one thing, uh, one more thing I wanted to talk about. Um, I like using signs for my different stations um, and it makes it easier instead of saying like, y'all go sit over there, I can say go sit at number three or go sit at station seven. And that makes it easier for kids to zip over and just go where they need to. Um, so I have some very simple station signs that I use over and over for different things. Um, and I don't make them specific like rhythm station or whatever. I just put station one, two, three, four. And so uh, then kids can see exactly where they need to go. This is super easy um, to tape up on the wall or on a cabinet or whatever. Um, or you can put it on a little stand or something. Um, and the other thing I like in here is to have a little arrow because even if you're super clear about where you where they go next sometimes kids don't listen or whatever so this is sort of helpful um one of the things you i mean if you want to get really fancy um you can do something like this this is something i've used when i when i talk about centers for uh like workshops and when i shared a workshop about centers you know if i'm sharing the center i i have station one and then rhythm i know that's backwards but it's there um and this is great but you can't really you know, use this in fourth grade and then reuse it in third grade if you're not gonna keep this a rhythm station. So sometimes the sort of more general station signs are easier than not. Um, one of the cool things I found um, online are these little uh, foldable cardboard stands and you just fold them down and pop them down and then when it sits down, it sits up on its own. So that's sort of cool. It's something I found on Amazon, but because I was, you know, presenting about centers, I thought, well, it'd be cool to have these stands and it comes like a pack of 30 or 40, so you could get that too. If you wanted to just stick that on the back of the laminated card and put that out. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna work and try and get these uh, center signs um, available as a freebie in, a, in an upcoming blog post, so look for that, because um, I'm gonna share a little bit more about centers and rotations and stuff like that on there. Um, okay, that's my quick run through about center um, organizing. Um, if you have more questions, please leave those in the comments. Um, I'm seeing not a lot of questions, but a lot of affirmation right now <laughs> of yes, color coding, yes, color coding. Um, and yes, not bag popping. Good. Cause nobody likes pop Ziplocs. Um, Dee says that she uses, she cuts them with different shaped scissors. So different centers, different shaped scissors, uh, before you laminate sort of cool, the edges. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of really, um, affirmative things like, yes, I do that too. Or there's this other thing. Um, let's see, can I put a link to the center signs? Yes. Um, I'll, put, oh, the backing. Yes. I'll put a link to that on the, on the links page. Um, Carrie asks why eight stations, eight stations means, um, well, and I talk about this a little bit in one of my blog posts, but if I have like 35 kids, if I separate them into eight groups, that means I have an, like an optimal number, like three or four in a group. Um, if you get groups that are too large, they just talk all the time. And if you get groups that are too small, they don't work together. I try and shoot for three or four kids um, in a group, in a station. And so if I separate them into about eight, um, usually that works pretty well. It depends on the class size. Um, but I mean, it's really up to you and what you want to do with the centers and how you want to, you know, how you want kids to interact. If you need a larger group, then you could you know, double them and up and put them in four, but um, eight works really well for me, eight centers of about three or four kids, or five, depending on um, how big your classes are. 
Um, I have a lot more about centers in those blog posts and also in my other live videos. So um, I'm gonna just stop there with the centers things, but if you have um, questions um, about those, please leave them in the comments and I'll try and answer them as I can or point you to those blog posts that I, that I have posted on makemomentsmatter.org. Um, let's see. Do all the stations fit in your classroom or do some of the stations fit in the hallway? They all fit in my classroom. I don't trust kids out in the hallway on their own. It's a pretty busy hallway. It's between the lunchroom and the gym and the office and it's like the main breezeway. So I don't put anyone out in the hallway. Also, if I can't keep eyes on them, I don't have them sit there. I always want eyes on kids. So I never put them somewhere where I can't see them. Um, okay, so that's a little bit about Center's organization. Like I said, there's a lot more in a couple blog posts and I'll point you to those. Um, and also I hope to blog more about those in the future. So um, after this video is over in the um, quick feedback, the three or four minute feedback, you could say, thanks for the Center's ideas or whatever, or no thanks for not answering my question. Um, and I would love to learn more about this specific aspect of Center's. Because if you say, I'd love to learn more about Center's, well, I could write for like four years just about centers. So if you're like, I would love to t talk specifically about this one thing about centers, that'd be really helpful too. Okay, well, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and um, talk just a little bit about second grade. Um, I uh, talked a little bit about this in the brief overview last week, but let me give you sort of a rundown and explain how I do second grade and why um, I do things this way with this second grade lesson. Um, so second grade generally starts with um, coming into our circle song, which I've talked about before. We do a little copycat game where um, we say that this copycat poem, um, and then I do um, either clapping and then they echo that, or patting, or they echo, and then or a vocal glide and they echo. But the copycat game is just me doing something that then they copy. It's usually pretty short, about four beats, if it's a rhythm or body percussion. Um, if it's vocal glides or something like that, it is not very long. And it's just a quick way for me to run through things. Um, with K1 and 2, generally at this time of the year, I do uh, clapping and patting, a vocal glide, and then maybe something else that's, um, you know, just a movement thing or something else that they can echo. Eventually I'm gonna add solfege into that so at the end of the year we'll be doing solfege back and forth. Um, we could do part of a poem back and forth that helps them learn the poem a little faster. There's a lot you can do. What I've added in on this time is um, we do padding and then a vocal guide and then clapping in first grade and second grade. And then I hand out hand drums. We talk a little bit about the procedure of the hand drum. Um, and then I, and I even did some Instagram stories about that, which you can find in the highlights if, if you want to uh, catch up. But I do uh, hand drum copycat. So um, I hand out hand drums. I'm lucky I have enough for um, a lot of the kids in the class, but I do about every other kid. And I hand out every other kid and as I'm handing out, I say, I'm going to hand out to just some people, see if you can figure out who's getting them and why. And so I hand them out to every other kid and I keep saying that, see if you can figure out who's getting them and why. And, and then kids realize like, oh, he's not just giving them to people that he likes, he's giving them to somebody for a purpose. And usually they figure out that there's a pattern and then I'm going every other kid. And so um, that makes everyone feel a little bit better, like they're not getting, you know, they're not getting passed over for no reason. It's because of a pattern. Um, the kids who first get the drums, we do an ec I play, they play, I play, they play. Um, and I say, if you don't have a drum, instead of playing a drum, just use your hand. Because, you know, they can still do that. When it's time to rotate, I say, put both hands on your drum and pass it to the person on your left. Because they're sitting in a circle, I walk around and I point what direction that is. Um, and I, I help them all rotate. And then the kids who are passed over are like, okay, this is fine because now I get to go. Um, and so those... The next set of kids, they do their they do their back and forth. Usually after the first time that, that that second group has gone, so now everybody's played once, I have them set the drum. Um, like a bowl, someone mentioned last week, and I had head down and we talk about um, if you hit really hard, um, it's it might hurt the drum. And so we talk a little bit about that. I have them hit their hand as hard as they can, and then and they go, ow, it stings. And I say, yeah, now think about if you were playing on the drums head, if you're playing on the drum and it were alive, would that hurt or would that sting? And we, we talk a little bit about that. Then we rotate through about two more times and then I have the kids put away. Doesn't take very long, maybe 10 minutes, um, but it's, it's great because the kids love doing anything instrument and um, it also gives them a chance to work through some basic rhythms, some ba basic instrument procedure and they rotate. It's just, it's lively and they like it. Um, 
And I have the kids put the drums away because they uh, nest together. Um, I have inside the drum and I've shown pictures on Instagram. Um, they're sort of in rainbow order. I put a stripe of tape inside each one. So the biggest drum is red, the next drum is orange and so on. So the kids can actually stack them on their own. And I take the time this time to point that out, to point out the rainbow order. But next time when I do it, I can just say, okay, if you have a red drum, go put it head down on the table. Um, orange, you get to follow, yellow, you get to follow, and, and hopefully they'll be able to put them all away on their own. Um, I do my attendance. Um, it's a singing attendance now. Um, and then we do a recap of our lesson from last week, which is Little Sally Walker. Um, we just do that a couple times. It's a fun circle game. Um, and after attendance, it's something to liven us up just a little bit. Um, even though it's singing attendance and it is actively working, the kids get a little bored if you have one of those larger classes. Um, and so it's, um, it's nice to do something a little bit more active. Um, I see Bryce mentioned, uh, do you find that kids get upset if they get the smallest drum versus the largest drum? I'll just address this really quick since we're still talking about drums a second ago. No, because uh, we, we rotate two or three times. And so even if they get the smallest drum, by the time we're done, each kid will have touched two different drums. So they won't have touched two of the smallest, you know, both each time. They will either get the smallest and then the next size up or the smallest and then the largest, depending on how I've handed them out. So that really hasn't been an issue as far as the drums. Um, we do Little Sally Walker and then um, we scatter out and um, I do a, a song that um, has been a favorite in my class for years and years. Um, and I, can't, I can't even think about where I first learned this, um, but it's sort of everywhere. Um, it's the Seven Jump song. If you're not familiar, I'm just gonna lead you through how I do it. Um, I was trying to pinpoint where exactly it came from and I find the Seven Jump song on Rhythmically Moving, which is uh, Phyllis Weikert but I didn't find it in her book. And then I found it on like eight different places online. There are a ton of different videos about how, uh, how to do it. Um, I think that the, I found it on the PBS website and they said that it's Dutch. So, I mean, there are a lot of different ways to do this song. I'm just gonna show you how I introduced it this year. It might be different from last year, but I'll just show you how I did it this year. Um, what I said to kids was, I'm gonna test your ears. I'm gonna test to see if you can hear the differences in music. And here's how I'm gonna do it. The first, well, we're gonna do some actions. And the first part uh, goes like this. You're gonna take your hands and you're gonna walk your hands on your knees to the steady beat. We do a lot of our hands are walking, so they know sort of what that's like, just alternating hands. And I just sing the, the Seven Jump song um, sort of piece by piece. And say, so, so just match me and we're gonna walk our hands. Doesn't need to be exact, but it's just sort of giving them sort of the contour of what they're gonna hear. Great, oh my goodness, that was so great. Maybe we would try it a second time. We're just keeping our hands to the city beat. Perfect, your ears are working great so far. The next part is different. It goes like this. So if there's the one, two, three. How many claps? Three claps, okay, so they answer, and then I go, and then we do the little spinning around, great. And then, the, let's try that together. Great, oh, you did that so well. Let's start back at the beginning and start with our feet walking, and then we'll do the clapping part. Great, oh, you did a great job, and I'm watching to see if kids are doing that. And actually, this does fit one of our standards. Uh, one of the Georgia standards is, can students show through movement contrasts in different sections of music? So we have different movements for different parts, and kids are able to show that. Um, the next part, the third part, I say this is my favorite part, because your hands want to touch. They want to touch so bad, but they cannot touch until you hear Bum, bum. Ooh, they cannot come together until you hear that last bum. So try it with me. And so the kids go, okay, you really, you want to clap them together, but you can't do it until that last part. So listen carefully. Bum. And a lot of kids try and sing along with me. And I say, no, 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 no. You don't know when it's going to happen. Just listen. Bum. Bum. And then they do it and they love it. Oh, 
great. Let's try that whole thing together. Oh my goodness. This time I'm going to add a part. After your hands want to go together, then your hands want to touch your knees, but they can't until they hear bah, you're right. So that this next time it's gonna go bah, 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 bah. Great, let's try that whole thing. And where they're still seated at this time. I'm just sort of walking them through this, doing sort of a finger play sort of a thing because I want them to get the main structure before we add um, harder step before we actually add the movement. And I, they are generally more successful if I do this with my hands before um, we actually do the movement. So once we've done that two or three times and they get the whole structure, I say, great, let's change something. This time stand up. And so they stand up. And I say, great, let's try it like this. Only this time instead of our hands walking, can our feet actually walk in place while we're doing this? Great, so I do. Oh, sorry, I did that out of order. Um, and so then I say, you know what? Since we're already standing up, instead of going, can you do this? And I do that, do that, and the kid's like, okay, they're on board. At this point, they've got the basic structure. And I say, I'm about to try it with the music, but there's one thing I have to tell you. Instead of doing your hands wanting to go together or your hands wanting to touch your knees, this time you're gonna raise up one foot and you really wanna put it back down and make it touch the floor, but you can't do it until you hear the bum, bum then you can put your foot down. So then we try it with music. And we do it non-locomotor, so we're not moving around the room. We're just staying in our one spot, walking in place, keeping a steady beat, and then doing the clap, doing the turnaround, and listening. Bah, 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 bah. And I don't know about you, but I always have the kids who go, mm, who are like trying to like match that tone, which is like good for you, <laughs> trying to match that. But, um, I want them to actually listen for the bah, the tonic note. I don't want them to sing the fifth. I want them to do the tonic. So like, I, I say like, no, 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 you've gotta, you gotta listen, you can't do it. Um, so if you wanted to try this uh, with your students, um, the music is available actually for free on Spotify. Um, if you go, let me pull it up here. If you go to Spotify and you search for Seven Jumps, um, it's available from Shenanigans um, and then under their, their uh, album, Dance Music for Children Level One. So um, if I wanted to play it, we'll see if it'll play. Okay, that started at the wrong place. Let me try it again. And I do with kids. And we do our walking. I'm sure I'm demonstrating because we're sort of changing, you know, how we do this. So I'm demonstrating with them. One foot. Oh, good. Only this time I'm gonna add something extra. So we try it again. They spin around. They spin around. First foot. Second foot. Next time I'm gonna add something new. So they do it. If you never tried it, the progression that I use is one foot down, second foot down, one knee down, next first foot, foot, knee, second knee down, next first, the fifth verse is foot, foot, knee, knee, elbow. And then it goes foot, foot, knee, knee, elbow, elbow. And the last one is foot, foot, knee, knee, elbow, elbow, forehead. <laughs> it's hilarious because the kids, once they get to elbow elbow, are like, what else are we gonna put on the ground? I'm like, I don't know, you have to listen. And they, they think that's hilarious. My hilarious <laughs> story is, uh, <laughs> so one day I'm doing this with kids. Um, and the next step is that, you know, you can do this like the next class, you could do it with locomotor movement. So instead of the staying in one place, you can actually walk around the room. Okay, that's like my next step for this, right? So, uh, 
last year, I was doing this song um, and I we got to the part where it was the, la the seventh jump, the seventh action. And as we're going down and our bump and our, my forehead hits the floor, <laughs> I hear click and the door is opening. And it's my principal walking in with like a prospective family or something like, hey, and this is our music teacher. And not only do they see me and all the kids down on our hands and our elbows and our knees with our foreheads on the floor, my face is always to the students and I just happen to have my back to the door. So they see me all tilted over and uh, my feet are in the air and like my butt is facing the door. I'm like, okay, great. So I'm glad this family walked in just then. Like later that day, I walked into to the office with my lesson plans and I was like, let me show you the objective. And they're like, no, no, you're, you're good. But anyway, um, so I'll just say, if you're doing this with kids, make sure that you are not in a compromised position if your principal happens to walk in during this lesson. Um, it, it's a really fun lesson. Kids really like it. They asked to do it again. And um, you can, like I said, you can find the music available online. There's uh, some really cool variations that you can find. Um, if you go on YouTube and search seven jumps, there's a way to do it in a circle. There's a way to do it um, with some different actions. So that's all available if you want to try it. Um, the other thing I'll say is that I'm pretty sure that it's also on the Rhythmically Moving CDs. And I think that it's on volume two, but I can't be sure of that. But it's a slightly different version, but it's the same song. It's just different instrumentation or it's a slightly different recording. So if you have Rhythmically Moving and it's downloaded on your computer, you can already use it. If not, you can find it on Spotify for free. When you search Seven Jumps um, or Shenanigans, uh, Dance Music for Children Level One. Um, and the kids love it. They just love it. <laughs> so um, I love it too when I'm not having a principal walking in and it's, it's pretty fun. But it also does fit my objective, which is I want students to be able to demonstrate different things that they can hear and different changes in music through movement. And that's what we're doing. We're doing a couple things. First, they're demonstrating different form. So they're, they're hearing changes in music. So when it switches from the first part to the second part, they're hearing that. They're also listening for the dominant tonic um, and they're waiting to put their foot down until they hear that tonic notes, that chord um, and that cadence. So that's really cool. Uh, but kids are hearing a lot of things and they're able to walk in um, locomotor and non-locomotor ways depending on how you're doing um, the song. So uh, from there, kids are pretty tired out and so that I have them go to a personal space and have a seat. And that's when I transition to my last activity which is the Note Neighborhood. Um, I've tried showing you things on my computer screen before and it has not worked. So I'm gonna try something different. Uh, bear with me for just a second. I'm gonna try and turn y'all around so that you can see. But let's just try this. Welcome to a different part of my office. I hope you don't see the dirty part um, where I put all the stuff that's normally on my desk and I move it so you can't see it on these videos. Uh, let's see, okay. So there's that, great. Oh look, there's that, perfect. It's my computer, welcome to my computer. Okay, so I say to kids, my prompt is, I want to take you on a little field trip and I want you to see um, a place that we've not been to. So please just watch. And even if you are super smart and you're able to read along, that's great. Please let me do the reading for us, just so, um, so you don't get ahead or behind or anything. So um, then I have this ready to go on my smart board and um, the little trick that just popped right up, I didn't have to turn it on. Um, the first screen is a blank slide that just has a black background. So my projector thinks it's projecting right now, but actually it's just projecting all black. Um, and so then this is ready to go on the next slide. Actually, I take this slide out, but I wanted to show y'all. Um, this is from the meeting the neighbors uh, PowerPoint that I use. And, um, and I use this for a specific reason because in this lesson, I want kids uh, to meet uh, the quarter note, oh sorry, you can't see that, the quarter note, the quarter rest, and eighth notes. Um, this specific PowerPoint has the half note and um, the, the whole note as well. I just don't do that with kids, and you'll see how I do that in a second. But um, I usually take this slide out, I just wanted to show you so you sort of knew what it was. But usually kids will go from black screen to this. And I read through it with them, I say, hi there, I'm Tommy, but all my friends call me Ta. Welcome to my neighborhood. This is my house. Nothing too crazy around here. We like to take it pretty slow. No need to rush. Have I shown you how I can hop? I always say my name anytime I hop through the air. Ta, ta, 
ta ta. And I do that with kids, I let them try it. Um, and then he says, nice and slow, that's the way to go. I take my time and let every hop count, no rushing me. Wanna try one more time? Remember to say my name every time I hop, nice and slow. Ta, 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 ta. And I've got this uh, cool little uh, projector, or sorry, uh, keynote um, clicker thing, and I can put a link to that. But it's nice because I can be far away from my computer and click to the next slide. Um, it also, you can't really see it, but it has um, a laser pointer on it that shows up really well on my smart board, but not on my computer screen. <laughs> um, and so I'm able to go like ta, 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 and bounce it actually along ta, and kids can follow along and see that. This uh, projector clicker was about 13 bucks on Amazon. You can find it uh, from a lot of different retailers, but it works just as well as the $26 one. I know because I bought the $26 version of this a couple years ago, and then I found it on Amazon for 12. So like, I know this is the same company it works just fine. You're doing an amazing job. Come on, let me introduce you to my neighbors. Now this is where um, it gets a little different. I made the Note Neighborhood uh, for the Takadimi rhythm system and also for the Tikka Tikka um, sort of more Kodai rhythm, says, rhythm system. <clears throat> I know a lot of people use Ta, TT, and Tikka Tikka. Um, some people, me, I use ta, ta di, takadimi for my breakdown, and I have a whole blog post about what you know rhythm syllables you might want to use and why. Um, this specific one, I use takadimi, so that's what I'm going to take you through today. Uh, but just so you know, you can also find it um, as a tikka tikka version if that's the the verbiage you use. So he says, "This is my friend Dion's house. Most of Dion's friends just call him D. Here comes Dion now. Dion is my best friend, and we're always high fiving." See how our arms reach out and our hands touch when we high five. And at this time, at this point, I usually go up to a kid and I say, hey, high five. And when we hit hands to high five, I stop and I say, this is the point where they took the picture. So that when kids see um, the connected, the bar of the eighth notes, I say, that's their hands coming together because it's really two different people. It's Ta and it's Dion, but they're connected together in this picture. You can see them. Um, I, I make that emphasis because the takadimi system, ta and the, the first and the second eighth note have a different syllable, ta and d, so that's why I sort of go through and talk about that. We high five all the time. Sometimes we even do a jump five. Watch how we do it. ta di. When you jump, it's hard to say it slow. You have to say ta di in the time it takes for one jump. And then I walk up and I say, oh, that's easy to do. Let me show you. And I jump and I go, ta D. Did I do it? And obviously I have taken too long to say the words. And they're like, no. So I try again. I jump and I go, ta D. And they're like, nope, you didn't get it. And so eventually I get a little faster. But I do that with kids because when when they say this, they'll say, ta D, right? But when you eventually get them to this, they'll go, ta D, ta D, ta D, ta. A lot of kids will do that, and I want them to go ta di ta di ta di ta. It helps when I when I bounce the little laser, but um, it also if I say the thing about the jump five, it gets them more used to saying ta di quickly, more quickly than they would just ta. So if they get here to this screen and they go ta di ta di ta di ta, I'll go say oh no, don't forget the jump five, ta di ta di ta di ta, and it makes it a little bit quicker. We try different variations, ta di ta, ta di ta, ta 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 di ta. And if, if they, if a bunch of them sort of biff this and, and miss it and they need to go back, I'll say, ooh, let's try that one again. Ready, go. And I won't say like, nope, you missed it. <laughs> I'm just like, ooh, good, you know what, let's try this one again. And, and we, we try it again. All right, well, let's be, well, my house is right down the street, but let's be careful going by this next house. You don't want to meet the neighbor who lives in this house. You don't want to meet her yet because she's, well, yoo -hoo! Hello! Are you new? Welcome to the neighborhood! Wait, are you walking by my house without saying hello? Are you walking by my house without saying hello? Are you walking away? Okay, this is, <laughs> I'm not just being weird. I mean, I am being weird. But I'm not just being weird because in, in no neighborhood, she's called the sassy half note. And so I'm setting up that she's sort of this sassy neighbor you don't quite want to meet yet. <laughs> and she does come back and, and has um, some sassy things to say. Um, but I'll just sort of skip on that for right now. 
And he goes, shh, is she gone? Did she go back inside? Shh, it's me, it's Todd. Do you recognize me? I'm in disguise. I know, I know, it's a really good disguise. But you're so smart, you probably recognize my house and my hat. Sometimes I hide from my neighbor in the pink house. You'll meet her another day. But when I put on this rest disguise on, you can recognize me, but she can't. Remember she has those really big glasses? It's because her eyes aren't so good anymore. I scrunch myself up and I put on these glasses and then I sort of point out like, okay, you can see Todd there and you can see uh, the rest. And you can see, oh look, their hats are the same. Yeah, and so the one on the right is just scrunched up. Okay, and I say, would that, do you think that would confuse any of you? And they're like, oh no, we get it right away. Okay, good. She thinks that I'm someone totally different. Now she can't see very well, but she has great hearing. And so I say, you're sure you wouldn't be confused if, if you know, you saw the hat or the, you know, if you saw someone in the glass all scrunched up and they're like, no, no, no. So I go, <coughs> oh, really? <coughs> and I pretend to cough and then I walk out of the classroom for like two seconds. And I put on, I have these huge, crazy, like oversized, you use them in like a photo booth glasses, like big, crazy, bright green glasses. And I walk out, put them on, walk right back in, all hunched over, and I walk in and say, ah, oh, hi, my name's Mr. Brown. I'm Mr. Rouse's substitute. He had to go home sick. You probably heard him coughing all the way down to the office. Anyway, what are we doing here today? And the kids are like calling me out already or laughing at me. Um, but I, I eventually pull off the glass and I say, did I, did I confuse any of you? And they're like, no, obviously not. <laughs> um, and I say, but even though I was wearing these glasses and I scrunched myself up, you knew who I was? And they're like, yes, of course we did. So that's probably why you're going to know that that's Ta the whole time. You can see him, you know, in, on the right, you can see he has those sunglasses on and he's all scrunched up, but you're so smart. You know that that's Ta. And that leads to this next part, that the sassy half note can't see him, but she can hear. So if you say, oh, hey, Ta, she'll go, Ta, where's Ta? So I say, if you see kid, kids, if you see Ta like this, um, here's what you need to do. Now, I have a couple options. I know a lot of you, when you do rest, you say, shh. So I have this option. So if you see me like this, don't say my name, just say, shh. But I actually don't do that in my classroom. So I take this slide out at school. And what I do is I say, so if you see me like this, you can say my name, you can even shout it. Just don't let any sound out of your mouth because I don't want her to know it's me. And then I go up and I demonstrate what that looks like, where I open my mouth and say, ta, but just with no sound. And then I shout, ta, but with no sound. And they think that is amazing. But it's nice because, I mean, really, arrest is a beat of silence. And so I don't do the shh, because even that sound, shh, is not silence. So when they say ta, they're reiterating that it's the quarter note, and it's the ta, the length of time for ta, but it's just the rest. So um, we say, don't let the sound out of your mouth. I don't want her to know it's me, but you can say my name, Ta, because I'm, I'm in my Ta, I'm Ta in my rest disguise, the Ta rest. Um, and then I, he does his little version, and, and the kids love that. Um, perfect, open your mouth wide and shout my name, but just don't let any sound out of your mouth. It's pretty fun to do. And then we try some examples, Ta, Ta, Ta. And every time they get to the, the rest, the kids are like so excited because they get to, say ta just not out loud or they get to shout ta just not out loud and we try some different versions of that this is one of the times where they go ta deep and and i have to go nope ta deep ta deep ta and help them remember the jump five in there and we get through and um ta goes um you've done a really great job i'm really impressed but you know i'm going to change out of this disguise all right well now you know my disguise you might want one too so you can hide from my sassy neighbor I need to go clean my room, but you can walk around the neighborhood a bit. Just be careful to avoid the pink house down the street or else my neighbor might spot you. Now, continuing on in this PowerPoint, they actually do meet, they can meet the sassy half note. And then eventually they go on to meet king whole note um, and they learn how to say a half, a half note and a whole note. Um, but since it says just, you can walk around the neighborhood um, instead of walking around the neighborhood, I black out the screen and I take this time, let me move these around, um, so you can see again. Oh, look, there's the door. Um, so I, I take this time to then show them where in the room, sorry, um, they can find um, 
notes and rests. So instead of uh, going on in the PowerPoint, um, I show them on the vocabulary wall where they can find uh, Taz and rests and um, we talk about their actual name. I say, you know, we call him Ta, but his fancy name is quarter note. So if you look up here on the vocabulary wall, you can see that there's a picture of Ta, but it says quarter note. So, and that's my idea of walking around the neighborhood to see other people is, is you can find where, where those things are in the room. And I, I think that's sort of a, a nice next step. The other thing I also do is I have a bulletin board that is the note neighbors. And so I can say, here are the note neighbors that we know already. We know three, we know Ta, Ta and his rest disguise, and we know the rest. And we've sort of seen the sassy lady, but we haven't really met her yet, you know that. We just sort of went by her house. And so um, I can sort of show them there are more neighbors to come and they're like all excited about that. Um, but we only know these three. So if you wanna see them next time, here they are. And that's one of those things where administrators really like when you point out where the visuals and the answers are on the wall. Um, and so I take the time to do that. And then it's time to line up and we're, we gotta leave. And kids are, get really excited about the note neighborhood. They ask me, you know, when are we going back to the note neighborhood? Um, which I love. Um, so then the next step for me for the note neighborhood would be um, either to introduce the half note. Um, for each of my note neighbor sets, um, I have um, uh, like an introduction page and then um, I have um, a practice page. So they can like, once you've met the, the ta rest, you can then go back to the ta rest and you can practice that with a little bit of an extended storyline, but just more practice with the ta rest or with um, ta or whatever it is. So that's sort of my, my intro to the Note Neighborhood. Um, I, I'm starting it in second grade. I, I mentioned this last time, but I'm sort of starting um, notation a little bit later because I only see kids once every eight days. Um, and I'm sort of testing out to see uh, if it, you know, if it is valuable in K and one to do more singing and doing and, and playing rather than to spend the time on notation. Um, and I've read a little bit and I've heard a lot of people say, and I've read a lot of people I really um, respect say, that you know, if you only see them once a week or less than that, you shouldn't be doing notation in K or one. So I'm trying it um, and I'll let you know how that goes. Um, so that's my, my second grade lesson for the week. Um, and I'll put, I've, I put some links already on that um, links page, but I'll go back and add some of those already. If you have any other follow-up questions about the specific content that I've talked about in this video, please leave a comment. Um, on Facebook or on Instagram or, or send me a PM, a private message or an email at makemomentsmatter at gmail.com. I would love to hear your feedback and get your ideas. Um, if you decide to take the three or four minutes to fill out that um, Google Doc survey that I've linked to on Facebook um, in the comments um, or Instagram on in my LinkedIn profile, if you take the time to do that, there's a freebie waiting for you at the end and it is a Note Neighborhood freebie. So um, if you go in, um, I appreciate the feedback and also um, it, it benefits you too. Anyway, thanks so much for coming along on the ride with me. Um, I do come back and I look at questions throughout the week. So if you're watching this on Tuesday or Wednesday night um, or Instagram, it goes away after a day. If you're watching it on Tuesday, um, leave a comment and I'll go back and try and answer that as, as best I can. Thanks so much for coming along with me. Please do that survey. Um, I'll put that link and um, have a great rest of your week. Thanks so much, everyone. Oh, and if you're in South Carolina or North Carolina or North Georgia and you want to come to the South Carolina Foothills ORF chapter, um, I'm doing a workshop there on Saturday. So I'd love to see anyone who's around. Um, I think I have some friends coming from North Carolina or from around South Carolina, and I would love to see everyone there. It's going to be a great time talking about lots of different stuff. Um, folk songs, how you can adapt songs and games and, and, and add to your lessons to make any song or game um, different, change to fit your purposes, your standards, and your needs. Okay, sorry. Had to get that in there. Um, I hope to see many of you there at the workshop on Saturday, but if I don't see you there, I hope we'll see you again here next Monday night. Uh, thanks so much and see you then.